We have a desperate longing for prediction. We have a pretty desperate longing to know the future. You know, about the time that a child figures out how to put a sentence together, they start demanding predictions. <laughs> and then, as we go on through life, we keep demanding predictions. And most of the time, when we demand a prediction, there's a particular answer we want. <laughs> Young folks, this is Paul McCartney. There was a thing called the Beatles. You kind of had to be there. Um, and in particular, that last one, that desperate need we all have to be told that someone's love for us is permanent, um, is so widely shared that there's a whole industry called pop music dedicated to meeting those needs. <laughs> and we should realize right away that it's because we want the prediction so badly that we should probably doubt the prediction. Most people, by the time they've gotten to the age of 30 or 40, have been told things like this enough times that they've had a chance to calibrate their own personal model and determine the, how, how much a prediction like this should be believed. We know deep down that the more desperately we want the prediction, the less we should probably trust it. So what can we predict? What does it mean to have an accurate sense of the future? And how does that affect our work? I'm going to talk about transit in particular, but there, I hope what I say will have obvious connections to whatever it is that you do, whether you're surrounded by people who are trying to predict ridership or traffic or prosperity or economic development or whatever it is. So let, think about this. How many adult elephants could fit in a wine glass? Notice the sensation of your certainty about the answer to that question. Now, often I have friends in the big data world for whom everything is empirical and who would come at me at this point and say, how can you just say that zero elephants would fit in a wine glass? Where's your study? <laughs> and yet the fact is we can all realize that a researcher would not even be able to get a grant to hire some elephants, buy some wine glasses, and actually do this experiment. <laughs> that is what it is like to be absolutely certain about the answer to this question, and the reason we're certain is that this question is about geometry. Now think about this. In 2100, how many adult elephants would fit in a wine glass? Now I'm asking you for a prediction. And you know what? I bet most of you are absolutely confident in giving me this prediction. In fact, one of the things about geometric knowledge, when you know that something is true geometrically or mathematically, is that to know it is true now is the same thing as knowing that it will be true in 2100. Immensely stable stuff, geometry, something you can really take to the bank. This famous image comparing how much space people take if they are in cars as opposed to on a bus, as opposed to on bicycles, is of course making a purely geometric point. It is an immensely powerful image because you can put this in front of people who don't necessarily share all our aesthetic or cultural values as new urbanists. Some of them may even be wearing those red baseball caps, make America great again, that's fine. Geometry is real for them too. You can bring them back to this. Much of what my do, I do actually in my business is convene very diverse stakeholders in a community, but I convene them in a particular way that forces them to experience geometry together so that they experience the same, uh, they, they all come to understand that they are in the same geometric space and have to solve a certain problem together and that geometry doesn't care what you think of it. It is precisely the complete lack of emotion that we have about geometric facts that makes them so reliable, exactly the opposite of predictions like, I will love you forever. So, it's always about space when we're talking about geometry. And the next key point to remember is that once you, if you really focus on geometry, you discover you have much clearer views about technology because technology never changes. Geometry never has, never will. 
So again, here's that famous image. How, many, how, how much space these people take if they're on a bus? How much space they take if they're in private cars? And now we can check out the various new innovations that are coming down the line. If everyone is using Uber and Lyft, it now looks like this. And then once we finally have driverless cars, it'll start looking like this. <laughs> Except, of course, it will actually be worse. We know this, don't we? The driverless car people are going to come right at me at this point and say, no, no, they'll be platooning, they'll be closer together, they'll take less space. Absolutely. That's a linear solution to an exponential problem. Here's the exponential problem. Because if you make things easy, people do them more. We can all interrogate our own experience and understand that's how that works. In fact, you can go all the way back into biology, into the nature of the economics of evolution, and realize that this is a pretty fundamental reality. This is really biology. But the rest of this, and finally, and it leads us to the idea that in the end we will probably be talking about a driverless bus because it's the only thing that actually brings us back to something that solves problems for dense cities. Um, all of the rest of that is geometry. Stuff you can really count on. So again, we all want predictions. The journalists are constantly asking me to answer this question. What will our cities be like in 2030? It's like all the journalists out there have been trained that that's what they're supposed to write stories about. How all this stuff will fit together, how it will all come about, what, what life will be like. I have no idea. I actually have certain ideas because I know that certain geometry will be the same. But this is not a question any of us should think we can answer, nor, it's a question who, uh, nor should we believe it, be believing the answers of almost anyone who claims to answer it. There are simply too many variables. But here's a key thing not to get confused. When we, when we ask all these people for their vision of what urban transportation will be like in 2030 or 2040, we're asking them to mix up three things that are very different. But if you want to actually form a clear opinion about whether those predictions make sense, you have to take these three things apart. So first of all, there's a problem associated with emissions and the efficient use of energy, and the solution to that problem is going to be electric vehicles. There's a problem about safety and the efficient use of labor, the efficient use of human time, and the answer to that is probably autonomous vehicles. And then there is a separate problem about the efficient use of space in dense cities. The definition of a city is that there is not much space per person. That is what a city is. And the answer to that has got to be big vehicles. Because only big vehicles can move lots of people in very little space especially very little horizontal space, the space of a lane. Now, I could take you through some more geometry to explain why a big vehicle moving through the city has to follow a fixed route. I'm sorry, Elon Musk, but it is not going to deviate to stop in front of various people's houses, because that would create a route that's too circuitous for all the 60 people on the big bus to be willing to follow. You go down the street, you walk out to it. That's how the geometry works. But now I want to ask you a very different kind of question. Do human beings, because fundamentally the question before us now is geometry can't take us anywhere, right? Because it doesn't answer our questions about values. It doesn't answer our questions about what we're trying to do. So that's why I want to ask you, do human beings value liberty? Think about that question. And then think about this question. In 2100, will human beings still value liberty? Now, you may feel like we're on very infinitesimally less secure ground than the first question, which was about geometry. But still, this feels pretty solid, doesn't it? That's because we're talking about biology. We're talking about a basic resistance to bondage or constraint, a basic freedom or ability to move that you, can, that you can carry all the way back through evolution. It's simply a characteristic of a successful animal in most environments. If you get down to barnacles and things are a little different, but among animals that remo remotely resemble us, they need to move and they need to be free to move. So it's pretty basic, isn't it? By the way, this is also history and legend and literature. One of the reasons I encourage you all to hire literature students is that a good literature student, especially somebody who studied the history of myth and legend, will be able to tell you right away when the issue you are facing is an issue that human beings have faced from the dawn of time. <laughs> I find this very helpful. Um, you know, 
the, a, a terrible conflict between a parent and a child, where the parent is getting on in life and is starting to feel anxious about, Im, about mortality and wants to feel that the child will somehow carry on their purpose in life and the child maybe doesn't seem to be doing that. King Lear. It's all in Shakespeare's King Lear. Everything you need to know about it. Not only that, King Lear is not, although Shakespeare wrote it down for us 400 years ago, King Lear is actually millennia old. The story goes back to pre-Roman Britain. It's, and for a story to last that long, it must be talking about something that's very nearly biological. That there will be, that in the course of a parent-child relationship, running usually from the birth of the child to the death of the parent, there will be these predictable conflicts. They always happen everywhere. That's why literature is written about them. So, if we all want liberty, let's see if we can visualize that. So this is an image my firm prepares a lot. This is a hypothetical person called Jane, and she's in a particular place, and this is a diagram of what we call an isochrone. This is for transit. It shows where Jane could be on transit plus walking in 15, 30, 45, or 60 minutes. Those are the three concentric, those are the concentric colors, white for 15 through pink for 60. And now I can show you, this is a business-as-usual alternative, and now suppose I'm proposing to do something fairly radical with the transit system. Take out a lot of unproductive routes, maybe, and build up frequencies on the main line so that people feel, so that a bus is always coming soon. And the result is that. Before, before, after. So now, when somebody wants me to not do this, when somebody wants to instead spend money on, spend all this money on turning one bus route into a streetcar, or designing a system so that these people don't have to transfer, or designing a system so that these people don't have to ride with those people, or designing a system that lets especially fortunate people have their own separate services geared to their own tastes. Whenever I'm asked to do, anyone who asks me to do any of those things is against this. They want me to do less of this. They want human beings to have less access to liberty and opportunity, because we can quantify what this is. In 30 minutes, the dark blue, as a result of this plan, Jane can reach 71% more jobs, and if she's at the site of an activity or job, 217% uh, more residents can get to her. That's the kind of analysis I can present. And this is 100% geometry. I have, I, am, I have said nothing about human nature. I have said nothing about predicting human behavior. I have said nothing about culture or fashion or desire. I have simply described possibility. And this is the beautiful thing about the concept of liberty, is that actually it is about creating pure possibility rather than predicting what people will do with it. So how do we take apart this black box of prediction? If you've been in this business for, for very long, you've encountered studies that look like this. We have some sort of proposal, it's going to go into the model, the black box, the magic black box, and out is going to come a prediction. Ridership, economic development, whatever prediction you want, right? And something magical is going to happen inside this box. It used, the box used to be called a crystal ball, now we call it a black box. And, but something about the sheer authority of the model and the confident way it's described is going to make us all trust it. It's very funny, sometimes when I have a proposal and I'm sitting in the room with modelers, one of the modelers will say, that looks like an interesting idea, we'll have to see how it does. By which he means not, we'll have to see if it works in reality, but we'll have to see what the model thinks. So that confusion, but that ten our tendency to describe model outputs as what is actually happening, as reality, is very telling. How much we, how desperately we need an answer, and therefore how desperately we need to trust the black box. Well, what if we just tried to, the other thing that's going on in the model, though, is that, the, is that we, want to, we want to trust the black box because we don't really want to see, think about the hidden assumptions inside of it. Hidden assumptions. And one of the biggest hidden assumptions, back here, is that Everything else is going to stay the same except this change. Everything else has to stay the same so that we can see the effect of this change. Some things are, are just continuing on on linear paths. Other things are staying the same. So how do we make... So think about what that means for a 20-year prediction. It means that we have to assume that when you're the same age that your parents are now, you will behave exactly the way 
they do. We have to assume that because our only way to imagine what's going to happen in 20 years is the evidence of what people are doing now, namely what your parents are doing. So I had this recent experience not long ago. We redesigned the bus system in Houston, Texas, took out a lot of little squiggles, built more strong main lines that will attract more riders. The red lines are the high-frequency network every 15 minutes or better. And this is the before network, and this is the after network. And I was trying to make the point that this is going to expand people's liberty expand people's opportunity. We have doubled the number of people and jobs connected by frequent service. Up, we, we're connecting a million people to a million jobs by frequent service. That's probably the sound bite that won the debate. But once when I was standing in front of the board with all the cameras on me and the press behind me and a big audience, the board chair kept pinning me down and demanding I answer the question, if we implement this plan, how much will ridership grow? And I said, after trying as much as possible to talk about liberty and other things, I finally said, okay, ridership will be up, would be up about 20% in two years, assuming nothing else has changed. This is obviously, and he was happy with that. But this is obviously a totally untestable prediction because all kinds of things will change. And because ridership happens to be very messy, and people can get into long debates and write lots of scholarly articles trying to figure out all the different factors that go into ridership, because there are a lot of them that have nothing to do with service design. Ridership is very volatile. It goes up and down. Um, predicting ridership is pretty nearly impossible. But I can say that I've expanded people's liberty. So again, what does it mean to predict 20 years in the future then, a generation? It means that you're a copy of your parents. It means, fundamentally, that we are counting on you to not surprise us in much, way, in much the way that an older parent may often feel that he's counting on his children to not be too different or to in some way show his influence, that for there to be a sense of immortality vested in the experience of his children. Again, King Lear. It's all in King Lear. And this almost brings us to one of the most irritating things parents can say to their children, something like, when you're older, you'll understand. In other words, we parents, we modelers, believe that fundamentally everyone is on the same life path, and hey, my kid is at an earlier place on the same life path. I remember being there, therefore I can predict my kid's behavior. It drives children crazy, and it should. Because the point of liberty, if we could talk about liberty, then we could talk about the fact that we actually encourage you to surprise us. We actually encourage you to create a better world than we did. We actually encourage you to follow your own pleasure and not just your parents' pleasure, and that that is what makes the world better over time. If you study medieval history, you'll know that there were thousands and thousands of years in which children did exactly what their parents did, and the result was an incredibly boring, agonizing, and bloody period of history. Um, progress began when children began not doing what their parents expected. So let's take apart this box, this black box. Network design goes in, ridership comes out. What's actually going on? What's actually going on inside the box is that they're actually quantifying liberty first. So, yes, network design plus some other things like land use and street design, which we can describe geometrically, come together to create liberty and opportunity. In other words, how soon can you, where can you get soon? Right? We can draw a picture of that. That's a geometric calculation. That's a cool thing in itself, isn't it? Regardless of what people do in response. It's cool that people have liberty regardless of what they do with it, right? And then there's this question about how you get to ridership. This is geometry. But now, getting to ridership, this is a mess. Because liberty and opportunity then have to be combined with pricing, with various generalizations about culture, and with all kinds of other externalities that cause ridership to go up and down. It's an awful, ugly, empirical problem. There are endless papers uh, positing somewhat unsatisfying correlations. The real answer is it's unpredictable. But geometry takes us a long way. Geometry tells us, for example, where big transit will succeed, where high ridership transit will succeed. I offer these little diagrams to people in my work because, again, it helps them not want data as much. 
just as we don't really need data about whether elephants fit in wine glasses. You do, we don't really need to do any more studies about the relationship between density and transit demand because it's geometrically obvious. These two lines each have two buses on them, which means they have the same cost, but the neighborhood at the top has twice as many people living there, so there are twice as many people around the same stop, so of course there's twice as much demand for any kind of travel. It's a simple explanation. You don't have to study it anymore. Ditto with walkability, how the permeability of a street network makes it easier for more people to walk to the stop in a shorter distance, whereas a highly disconnected ne ne street network is essentially chopping off parts of the stop's potential catchment area and making it inaccessible, thereby shrinking the market. And of course, the, the, the fact that you always have to be able to cross the street at a stop. Linearity. The first two, density and walkability, all my new urbanist friends understand, architects, developers, urban designers, everyone gets those too. This is the one that's specific to transit, so I have to jump up and down about it. Linearity. We have to be able to organize things in straight lines. It's two versions of the same city. The one on top has all four major destinations in a straight line. Therefore, I can run a single line that serves all of them, that feels like a direct path in between them. The fewer route miles I have to run, the more frequency I can run, and frequency drives ridership. That's all geometry. The one on the bottom, if everything is set back, the little college up on the hill behind its green belt, the Walmart behind a quarter mile of parking, we're, we have a no-win situation for transit. And so this is where I need to start a little rant. I have to insert this rant in every speech I give at the CNU because I know that it, I, I, I can never quite say this enough times. This will be short. Here's how it goes. I was just the other day in Missoula, Montana, and I was driving around, because I was doing a transit plan, so I was driving around looking at possible routes, and I stumbled upon this. This is a lovely new urbanist town center. It's sort of right out of the Calfort playbook from 25 years ago. I don't know whose work it is. There's nobody there because it's not quite built out. It's not quite occupied yet, but it's obviously going to be lovely. Lots of nice main street, lots of high density around it, a big park. Who could ask for more? Problem is, it's here. It is in a giant cul-de-sac neighborhood coming off of a highway, and there will never be anything further west of it because that's the airport. So it is permanently in a cul-de-sac situation in the city, and that means that when I try to draw a transit line, I end up having to draw something squiggly, which works in the short term because there aren't that many people living up north. But up north is a big growth area. And over time, more and more people are going to be riding from the north and cursing the people of Connolly for making them ride around that deviation. So that's why I would suspect that someday in the long term, the route will need to look like that, because there will so, be so many people coming from further out that this awful squiggle just to deal with this badly sighted new urbanist village will no longer be acceptable. And as a result, we are never going to be able to get as much transit to this village as its density considered in isolation would deserve. Quit building this. I'm seeing this around, around cities all over America as I travel. I am seeing new urbanist villages in cul-de-sacs where the geometry is such that high-quality transit provided efficiently is impossible. Stop building this. End of rant. <laughs> I just want to end with the notion of leaning into the wind. One of the things I think we know, especially if we read tech journalism, is that we're bombarded with predictions. Journalists want everyone to give them predictions. Journalists tend to go back to people who are willing to make predictions, and so the market tends to select. The market of, of journalist Rolodexes tend to select for people who are willing to make predictions. I somehow seem to get a few interviews despite not being one of those people. But when I'm trying to track all of this and help other people track, how do I make sense of all of these predictions that are coming at me? The best principle I can suggest is the very old principle of leaning into the wind. On a windy day, if you want to stand up straight and the wind is coming this way, you need to lean this way. You need to lean against the direction of the wind precisely to the degree that the wind is pushing you the other way. If you don't, you'll follow. Wind, in this metaphor, is money trying to convince you of things. It is the sheer force of public relations campaigns, the sheer force of, of groupthink that is pushing you to believe a certain thing about the future. And your options are to fall over this way, which is exactly where they want you, 
right? Uh, completely accepting whatever they're selling in terms of a vision of the future. Another option is to fall over this way, which is the position of the cynic. Oh, those driverless car people, they're not up to any good, I'm not going to listen to anything they say. Either way, you've fallen over, you can't see anymore. To stand up, you have to lean precisely to the degree that you feel the pressure of self-interest, right? You feel the pressure of a message that's coming at you because, from people who will profit off of you believing that message, right? And you have to just lean to precisely that degree. That's not cynicism, that's skepticism. That's clear-headedness. That's where you can still see things like geometry. So, it's because we want the prediction so badly that we should doubt the prediction, but there's an exception, which is that one thing we really want is liberty. We want the freedom to do things and go places. Uh, we want I want everyone to have the freedom to do what they want to do without me needing to predict what they will do. That's what liberty is. And that is geometry. Pure geometry can get us there. Thanks very much.